The United States government is deporting historic numbers of undocumented immigrants. This despite promises by President Obama and U.S. lawmakers to pass immigration reforms. Now, a group of Hispanic Americans are fed up with the delays and are finding new ways to bring about a change in policies. Our White House correspondent Jessica Stone reports. With one simple phrase, National Council of La Raza President Janet Mergua signaled the height of Hispanic American anger at U.S. President Barack Obama, saying, quote, for us, this president has been the deporter in chief. Around the country, immigrant advocates have rallied and marched to stop Obama's policies, which have led to nearly two million deportations of undocumented immigrants. The deportations are getting more aggressive. Mr. President, without a doubt, I guess you agree that your credibility has been somewhat tarnished. With On a Telemundo televised town hall, U.S. President Barack Obama shot back. What I've said in the past remains true, which is until Congress passes a new law, then I am constrained in terms of what I'm able to do. With that one finger that the president is pointing at Republicans, there's four that are pointing at him. With that one finger that the president is pointing at Republicans, there's four that are pointing at him. Tonight on Frontline, as a candidate, he promised to fix the immigration system. The system just isn't working, and we need to change it. As president, Obama cracked down hard. What did he give us? A million people been deported. Frontline, the investigative reporting workshop, and correspondent Maria Inojosa investigate Obama's tough immigration enforcement. Hasn't the president ended up enacting the Republican agenda? What the president is doing is enforcing the law of the land. Examining his promise to deport hardened criminals. 1,000 murderers, 6,000 sex offenders, 45,000 serious drug violators. While critics say the program has swept up thousands of immigrants with no criminal record. A mother who had a broken taillight being separated, maybe forever, from her children? They don't understand how their mother could have been thrown out of the country. And investigating conditions in the vast network of immigrant detention centers. Women harassed for sexual favors. Guards taking detainees and beating them, running them down like they were animals. Tonight, how the politics of immigration are lost in detention. These are the front lines of a new immigration crackdown in America. Federal officers from ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, on their way to arrest some of the millions of immigrants who are in the country illegally. First target, guys, he's got conviction of hit and run. Also, he's got DUIs. He's a final order. He goes to work between 6.30 and 7 o'clock. Any questions? These so-called fugitive operations are part of an immigration enforcement offensive We're pretty sure the guy's gonna be here. that has reached historic levels under the Obama administration. The team has been doing surveillance on this house for the last few days. Target's out right here, right here on my right side. This year, about 400,000 undocumented immigrants will be detained and deported, totaling more than one million since Obama took office. We have a job to do. We enforce immigration law and, and we seek to remove people that are here illegally from the country in terms of protecting the public and also in terms of border security. We're setting records with our enforcement results. In terms of apprehending people, putting them in a detention system, and then removing them from the country, the scale has gone way up.
Under Obama, the numbers are significantly higher than they were under Bush. So Obama has juiced up the Bush policies. We have strengthened border security beyond what many believed was possible. Earlier this year, the president came to the border in El Paso to defend his tough enforcement policies. And we are deporting those who are here illegally. While at the same time pushing for comprehensive immigration reform. Now we need to come together around reform that reflects our values as a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. The administration has believed since it was sworn in that in order to make the political ground fertile for a comprehensive immigration reform bill, that enforcement had to come first. But there is no chance of comprehensive immigration reform in the current political environment. There's just, there's no support on the Republican side. Washington has been unable to enact new immigration legislation for like 20 years. People forget that the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which was the nation's last large-scale legalization program, was under President Reagan. And what that act did is it, it ended up legalizing um, 2.7 million people in various categories. The main categories were people that were in the country from um, January 1st, um, 1982, up to the point of the program. And, um, and also certain Cuban-Haitian entrants, um, agricultural workers, and then it also moved up the, what's known as the registry date, which is the date where um, very long-term residents in the United States can, um, can ultimately legalize. So the date had been people who had been here before 1948, and it moved it up to 1972. So it's best known as a legalization program. However, there were two other parts to the program. One was um, increased border enforcement and the second was to make it a crime and it hadn't been a crime before to actually hire um, un unlawful immigrants and, um, and it also created sanctions for employers that did that. The issue was that the, you know, the sanctions weren't s strictly enforced and, um, and the bigger issue was that it didn't change the legal immigration system and it kind of led to the, because it didn't do that, it led to the creation of a fairly significant unauthorized population in the United States. And it's in this vacuum that enforcement all of a sudden has become this kind of talisman. That you have to prove the government is in control. In the absence of reform, we're left with essentially enforcement on steroids. But that's all we're left with. That, that is our immigration policy. This is the story of how that policy is playing out. Often far from the border, in places like Maple Park, in the president's home state of Illinois. Antonio Arceo and his wife moved to Maple Park from California five years ago to raise their five children and live near family. Then, last February, Antonio told me he received a call that changed everything. I was working and about four o'clock I received a call from my wife's own cell phone but a man was speaking. He asked in English if I knew Roxana Garcia, who's my wife. I said yes. He said it's the police, Kane County Sheriff. Your wife has been detained for not carrying a license. Can you come pick up your kid? Roxana had been stopped for speeding and was held overnight in the county jail. Next morning when I went back, she was no longer there. I asked the lady there, how come? They told me she was getting out the next day. She said no. Immigration came this morning and took her away. Antonio had no idea what the government had done with his wife. 
He spent days looking for her. I went around to all the jails where she could possibly have been held and nobody would give me information. So at that point I was desperate because we didn't know what had happened. What he didn't know is that Roxana had been taken six hours away to southern Illinois, swept up by the administration's widening net of enforcement. Roxana was being held in detention. At the center of this story is a federal program called Secure Communities. in which ICE has extended its reach by enlisting the help of local law enforcement to better identify illegal immigrants who have committed crimes. The Sheriff's Department here in Lake County, Illinois, north of Chicago, joined Secure Communities in 2010. The Sheriff is Mark Curran. I think in law enforcement, especially since 9-11, it has been impressed upon us that you need to work as a team when you have local, state, and federal law enforcement all sharing information, all working together, all contributing to each other's task forces. That's when, when we work best. An elected Republican and former prosecutor, hey, folks. Curran says he came to realize that about 20 percent of those locked up in his jail were undocumented immigrants. Um, they're everywhere. Probably every fifth one of them. The people that's in here, in all likelihood, is uh, undocumented. He decided the government wasn't being tough enough. As a result, I thought, you know, let's let's close down these borders. Let's start deporting these people as fast as we can, and let's let's return the rule of law to its place. Secure communities seemed like the right tool. The goal is to identify people aliens who are removable from the United States based on their criminal background while they're still within the premise of the criminal justice system, not giving the opportunity to be released on the street and commit other crimes. This system is designed where a person will be arrested, booked into a jail or a prison, and just by the submission of those fingerprints, instantly sent off, not only would all of the criminal justice systems be checked, the immigration databases would also be checked at the same time. So within seconds, literally seconds, you would have the immigration vetting almost complete by identifying that person. Do we know why he was arrested? It appears that he got charged with leaving the scene of an accident that resulted in injury and or death. It is a felony. The Obama administration says secure communities is essential to taking the worst criminals off the streets and removing them from the country. We have record-breaking numbers in terms of criminal alien removals, 195,000 last year. About half of the people we removed, that included 1,000 murderers, 6,000 sex offenders, 45,000 serious drug violators. As we expand the deployment of secure communities focused on criminal aliens, you'll see that number continue to go up and up. But critics say Secure Communities is sweeping up more than just serious criminals. And in Illinois, one case in particular got a lot of attention. It started about 75 miles west of Chicago, in McHenry County, when local police made a routine traffic stop in March of 2010. The driver had changed lanes without signaling. All of a sudden, I saw the lights in the police car turn on. That's when the policeman stopped me. I didn't even know why until later on. He asked me for my driver's license and car insurance. I didn't have a license. He said I was going to be arrested to cause someone to pick up my truck and little girl. He simply put me in the car and took me to jail. What did you understand that you were being arrested for? Because I didn't have a license. When Susana Ramirez was booked into custody, her fingerprints were sent to ICE under the Secure Communities Program. ICE quickly put a hold on her. She was in the country illegally. Have you ever been arrested before? 
Do you have a criminal record? No, it's like no, that was the only time. Not even in Mexico. This is the first time this has ever happened to me. A single mom with two daughters, both American citizens. Ramirez says she fled the violence of Mexico's drug wars after being threatened with kidnapping in her hometown of Durango. She came to the U.S. legally in 2007 and found work in Illinois cleaning houses. Then she overstayed her visa and says she was afraid to return home. For me, the place I wanted to be was Mexico. But I had to emigrate because of the circumstances. For fear. Because of fear, exactly. The sympathetic story of a mother facing deportation was picked up by immigration activists and politicians. A state bill, known as Susana's Law, was introduced to deny funding for secure communities. The federal government should stop deporting the parents of American citizen children who have never, like this wonderful woman, who have never committed any serious violation of the law. This is Congressman Luis Gutierrez, Thanks. Democrat from Illinois, Congressional Hispanic Caucus. Yes. We've talked uh, this week even. Yes. Uh, I'm sure it's been all a blur for you, but uh, help me understand from your perspective as a Democrat that the notion that, that, that your, the Senate Minority Leader, Chuck Schumer, went to the Oval Office yesterday, had a conversation with the President, was willing to uh, pay for, it sounds like, a, a little bit of this wall, something sure. that many in his party vehemently oppose. Sure. Would you be willing to build a wall in order to protect dreamers? Sure. Look, I think it would be a monumental waste of taxpayers' money um, to build a monument to stupidity. But if that's what it's going to take, to take 800,000 young men and women and give them a chance to live freely and openly um, in America, then I'll roll up my sleeves. I'll, I'll go down there with bricks and mortar and begin the walk. Because, you know, a brick for lives? Okay. Let's do it. And let me just say, that wall is offensive to me. It's insulting to me and people like me that have come to this country. But you know, um, so people, of my, people of my generation will do what we have to do because that's what we do for younger people. That's what we do. Madam President, all week I've been outlining the humanitarian and security crisis at our nation's southern border. I've discussed the threats from the inflow of drugs and criminal aliens. I've shared career border security experts' strong support for physical barriers. And I've cited the empirical data that actually backs them up. But on day 20 of this partial government shutdown, a shutdown being prolonged by my Democratic colleagues' refusal to even come to the table, I thought I might try something different this morning. So I brought a visual aid. The chart behind me, right here, uh, sums up my Democrat colleagues' past and present positions on border security. On the left, over here, you have a border fence made out of steel bollard at the U.S.-Mexico border in Nogales, Arizona. Construction on this upgraded steel slat barrier began back in 2011. At the direction, mind you, of President Obama's Department of Homeland Security. This fence over here, under President Obama, at the direction of his Department of Homeland Security. Just five years prior, Senator Obama joined with then-Senator Hillary Clinton, the current Democratic leader, and several other Democrats when they all voted to authorize 700 miles, 700 miles of physical barriers under the Secure Fence Act of 2006. Now, Madam President, on the right, 
we have an example of a barrier like those the new Speaker of the House has recently described as immoral. Now I would defy my colleagues to tell me what the difference is. They're exactly identical. So we went from the Obama administration when everybody was supporting a wall that looked just like this to the Trump administration where now it's immoral. The kind of barrier all of a sudden the Democrats are so opposed to that they want to prolong the partial government shutdown. They'd rather do that than agree to an additional investment of approximately one-tenth, one-tenth of one percent of federal spending. I appreciate the opportunity to speak directly to the American people tonight about how we can end this shutdown and meet the needs of the American people. Sadly, much of what we heard from President Trump throughout this sense of shutdown has been full of misinformation and even malice. The president has chosen fear. We want to start with the facts. The fact is, on the very first day of this Congress, House Democrats passed Senate Republican legislation to reopen government and fund smart, effective border security solutions. But the president is rejecting these bipartisan bills which would reopen government over his obsession with for forcing American taxpayers to waste billions of dollars on an expensive and ineffective wall. Identical walls, exactly alike. When President Obama was there, they were for it, and President Trump's there, they're not. As I said, it's the same photograph twice, basically. I do that to underscore the point that the Trump administration is requesting funding for the same kinds of physical barriers that the Obama administration was actually proud to build. Bragged about it. Fencing with spaced slats that allow visibility made with reinforced steel. They're the same kinds of barriers that customs and border protection experts have told us actually produce real results. You can call them walls. You can call them fences. You can call them steel slats. But what they really are is effective. That's what they are. Call them what you will, they're effective. According to the Government Accountability Office, after the outdated fencing in Nogales was replaced by this particular steel slat structure, the Border Patrol reported a significant drop in violent encounters with illegal immigrants. Now, the Border Patrol is not on either side in this debate. They're just giving, you the, giving us the facts, just the facts. During the two years leading up to the 2011 construction, 376 assaults on Border Patrol agents were recorded in the Nogales station. In the two years after, after the bollard fence went up, the number of assaults fell to 71. That's 376 down to 71. That's a decline of 81%. The cartels own this entire border. They, you have to pay someone in order to get permission to cross in their area. In the past year, 521,000 people have been apprehended while crossing the United States' southern border illegally. In 2015, then-presidential candidate Donald Trump said that if he were to become president, America would have a big, beautiful wall in its southern border. I will build a great, great wall. Nobody builds walls better than me, believe me. After his election, he sought to build the wall, which would likely cost tens of billions of dollars. So far, he has secured $1.6 billion to build new barriers and replace old ones. I'm from Massachusetts, far from the border. Illegal immigration has never been an issue I had strong feelings about. And honestly, I wasn't even sure if a border wall would slow down or stop illegal immigration. But I wanted to find out for myself. So I traveled to our border south of San Diego to see what's really going on. I'm Cassie Dillon with The Daily Wire, and today I'm touring our southern border with Border Patrol agent TK Michael. 
The first thing TK told me was that there's a lot of construction going on on the border. There are currently two barriers lining the San Diego border, both of which are in the process of being replaced. The first wall, built in 1991, is made out of leftover helicopter landing mats from the Vietnam War. So this was in Vietnam? Yes, this was what they used to land on the rice paddies. I'm not an athletic person, but I think I can handle this. For 30 years, this has helped us secure this border. Stopping mainly vehicles. Absolutely. Well, it's time to be upgraded, I think. <laughs> I, I, I agree. In 1997, a secondary wall made of steel mesh and barbed wire was built no more than 100 feet from the first wall. This wall is easily penetrable and can't really withstand power tools. We've seen hundreds of different incisions. There's some right here, there's one right here. They're just lining the wall. This is people coming and cutting through the fence and you know, either putting things in there or actually crossing in through the incision. In 2017, six companies were given 30 days to build prototypes for President Trump's proposed 30-foot-tall border wall, which would replace the steel mesh barrier. Each prototype cost $450,000, but a finalist has still not been chosen. Um, you can see they're all different. We did a testing and evaluation process, which took about 60 days. What did the testing include? The testing included um, anti-scaling, anti-climbing. I can't um, imagine scaling this. You can see it's 30 <laughs> feet tall, very intimidating. Yeah. In 2017, funding was secured to replace the Vietnam-era barrier with an 18-foot tall see-through fence made of steel posts and anti-climbing plates. This modern fencing extends all the way into the ocean. And so what's the benefits to the new see-through border compared to this one? We have no idea what's on the south side. If I'm being assaulted, if I am you know, patrolling an area and there's a group forming eight to 10 people, I wanna know and I wanna be able to see what's going on. You believe that having a barrier there is effective for helping you guys do your job? Absolutely. Any type of infrastructure that we can put into place, it, it essentially just gives Border Patrol agents time. So what dangers do Border Patrol agents face that the normal person wouldn't think of? We're often in remote locations. We patrol usually by ourselves in a vehicle, so we're constantly needing to remain vigilant about anything coming across that we can't see. So whether it's anybody trying to assault us on the, the south side. What do you mean by uh, assault? Any blunt force object that they can get their hands on, whether it's a big boulder, softball size rock. We've seen different kind of weapons. The cartels own this entire border. Whatever they need to use in order to continue north into our country, um, they'll do it by any means necessary. After visiting the border, I realized that more effective barriers can help our Border Patrol agents stop illegal immigration and drug trafficking. Whether that means finishing the first primary barrier or constructing a 30-foot wall, something needs to be done. Hey everybody, welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. I'm here with Ron Placone and the political vigilante Graham Elwood. You know, uh, Bernie Sanders was, uh, when he wanted to have Medicare for All and free college and Hillary Clinton referred to those things as ponies. <laughs> everybody wants a pony. But, you know, remember how they said, you know, Bernie's a fairy duster, pie in the sky. How are you going to pay for that? How are you going to pay for free college? Free college for the whole country? We couldn't. We can't afford that. We can't afford. Why are you going to pay for that? So they can't afford free college, but guess what they just did? The Senate's military spending increase alone is enough to make up pub college, a public college free. They just, so uh, Trump wanted to spend an extra $55 billion over what Barack Obama spent last year in his bud Pentagon budget. But guess what? Congress went ahead and they said, that's not enough, Trumpy. So they decided to spend 700 billion more dollars like that. 700 billion more dollars. Now, how much would it cost for free college? It would cost roughly, some people say 45 billion. Some people say 65 billion. So let's say, let's say 60, take the high number. 65 billion. They could have had that like that. We could we could all have free college right now because 
So those concerns about paying for all that stuff, those concerns were brushed aside Monday night as the Senate overwhelmingly approved an $80 billion annual increase, which over te- which turns out to be a $700 billion increase. So $80 billion every year. $80 billion annual increase in military spending, enough to fully satisfy Sanders' campaign promise of free college. They just did it like that. They just did it like that. Boom. Oh, we need $80 billion more a year? Okay, vote. Boom. Done. No discussion. No talk shows. No endless p- uh, of editorials. No hand-wringing. No debates with different panels back and forth. Nothing. Nothing. Just like that. Hey, you want 80? You need 700 more billion dollars? There you go. We got it. By the way, Flint still doesn't have clean water. And you know how much it would cost to fix that? It wouldn't cost a billion dollars. Not even one of those billion dollars to fix it. But they got 700 for the mil- for more bombs that we don't need to go create more terrorists. Boom! We got it. So I've been saying in my stand-up back, That when they say we're broke and we don't have money, they're either or they're using a Texas math book because we're the richest country the face of the earth has ever seen. We can afford stuff no matter what. When they say that you can't afford stuff, they don't mean we can't afford trillion dollar bank bailouts, trillion dollar wars, billion dollar oil subsidies and prison construction. That's not what they mean. They mean they can't afford anything that helps you like single payer or cheaper drugs or free college or a living wage, anything that helps you, they can't afford it. 